Uh, thanks very much. Um, and it's really not um, grateful for NSAED asking me to come back and, and, and do a talk. It's some years since I, I did one, so it's a, a real pleasure to, to come back. Um, okay, I, I'll, I'll start straight away. Um, in, in this talk, I want to consider a convivial notion of belonging viewed as an evolving construction, always incomplete, in which otherness is integral and involving a continuous mutation of self and others. This contrasts with the notion of belonging to that invokes prescribed identities affiliated to an established order, which can then invoke the negation of not belonging, resulting in the violence of exclusion that we witness almost endlessly in many forms, some of which are mentioned in the conference description. But what does belonging mean in the context of educational practices, or more specifically, those of art education? Belongingness suggests a feeling of connectedness and acceptance, but implicit to this idea of belonging, as just mentioned, is that which does not belong, that which lies outside, that which is other or another. This suggests a state of constant indeterminacy. In this short presentation, which is extracted from a much longer paper, I'll argue that belonging is not to be conceived as relative to an already established order, community, etc., subject to what we might call regulatory controls, but is in fact created through ongoing encounters with otherness, which with, with uncertainty and difference, and therefore requires a constant art of making, unmaking and remaking. This suggests that belonging has to be conceived as a metastable process, never complete, a persistent problematic of practice. Thus, we might view belonging as inherently antonymic. In educational practices, this implies a shift of emphasis from a notion of belonging that assumes established or prescribed identities and boundaries, pedagogical, epistemological, ontological, to one that views educational practices more in terms of strategic experimentations in what the human and the belonging can become. Such becoming arises from the metastability of encounters with otherness and its problematic gift. What I'm referring to here is being able to receive that which seems strange, that which suddenly emerges, or which does not fit established patterns of practice or thought as a gift that can expand or transform such patterns. It is, it's in this sense of a problematic that I want to think about the notion of belonging by giving some brief scenarios, the aim of which is to open up collective debate for possibilities in pedagogic practice. Scenario one, pluralism and points of view. Recent studies in anthropology have explored the idea of a plural universe, a plurality of species, in which we humans are only one amongst many. To belong to the human species is by implication also to belong to a plurality of other species. We might say that we exist in a world of many worlds, affected by and affecting others. This pluralistic understanding of belonging raises the issue of divergence, dissymmetry and difference. It is in the sense of what I call convivial belonging that we cannot simply conceive of belonging in human terms, but also in non-human or more than human terms, in which the notion of we is inclusive of the other species amongst which we cohabit. We humans, trees, animals, viruses, oceans, rivers, mountains, and so on. This would reverse anthropocentrism and engage with a biocentrism and call upon a respective bioethics. Perhaps a shift from human democracy to a cosmocracy, a concern for the whole. Such a pluralist universe means that what facilitates belonging is not identity, but difference, endlessly arising through encounters and interactions. This suggests that the human is always faced with otherness, with that which lies outside of what is currently understood as human within its different contexts of living. Boundaries are therefore not fixed or stable, in relation to identities, cultures or institutions, thereby unsettling concrete underpinnings and emphasizing relationalities, convivialities, which in turn suggests vulnerabilities, potentialities, uncertainties and experimentations. 
In very brief terms, the anthropologist Viveros de Castro states that in Amerindian cosmology, all beings, human and non-humans, are subjects or persons. And to be a subject is to be able to take a point of view or a perspective. There are no points of view onto things, rather things and beings are the points of view themselves. The ontological implications here are that rather than seeing things differently, we see different things. The point of view creates a cosmicity. So rather than the Western idea of multiculturalism that posits different representations of the world, the notion of cultural relativism, that is, Amerindian perspectivism posits a multinaturalism of different worlds, a perspective that is deeply ontological, emerging from a specific body in place. It is an assemblage of affects or ways of being that constitutes a habitus. Can we glean something of value for working with difference and divergence in pedagogic work from these brief comments on perspectivism and multinaturalism? Rather than thinking, rather, <coughs> sorry, rather than thinking of a culturally responsive art education, we might want to consider the idea of a multinatural art education vis-a-vis -vis different modes of existence, their manners and arts of becoming, their potentials and possibilities. Perspectivism provides alternative conceptual tools to help us develop new sensibilities, new ways of negating the negation of otherness and to challenge established values when necessary. It seems to require a permanent decolonization disposition, a decolonizing disposition rather, to thought and practice as we encounter otherness, to pluralize our notions of practice and not the unquestioning deployment of established and conceptual of established conceptual frameworks. If we try to award each practice full ontological legitimacy, its own nature, recognizing its viability as a practice, as an alternative mode of practice, and thus an alternative mode of belonging, this opens up what practice and its potential might be capable of. Scenario two: negative capability. The English poet John Keats developed the concept of neg negative capability, which refers to the artist's ability to live with and explore the uncertainties, contingencies and the unknown without prematurely resorting to an armour of preset attitudes or behaviours. We can contrast this disposition of being in uncertainty, its contingencies and interstices to the security of established knowledge and practice. Negation in Keats' sense refers to the negation of the negation of contingency in contrast to holding on to the security of established practices. For the artist, this negation of the negation of contingency and uncertainty and putting aside the armour of established practices and values in effect demands the courage to suspend or dissolve the structures or sense of self, we might say the structures of belonging. The implications of such negations for the practice of art, educations are, art education are profound, highly paradoxical and or antonymic. Because while the artist embraces contingency and uncertainty and the negation of self, and by implication challenges the idea of belonging, we might argue that a key purpose of art education is for students to develop modes of practice that constitute and affirm existential identity, self, <clears throat> and a sense of belonging. Can this radical notion of negative capability be squared with art education? To answer this question, <clears throat> George Canguilhem's notion of normativity seems important. For Canguilhem, normativity does not simply denote existing social structures, rules and standards, accepted modes of behavior, moral codes and values that function as principles or guidelines to live by. Rather, it concerns the individual's reassertion of his or her power to act, to judge and decide. In other words, the power to generate new norms in answer to life's contingent events. For me, this relates to the idea of art practice as the instauration of new cosmicities, which I'll come to. Scenario three, artists teacher narratives and emerging cosmicities. On the ground artists teacher narratives and conversations, their pedagogies matter because their difference and divergence can make other worlds appear, along with their possibilities and potentials. 
they invoke a pragmatics of the suddenly possible. The importance of such artist teacher narrations and their inventive capacities for artifactual artifactualizing ideas, visions and propositions from the collective authority of their experiences of practice is that they extend or multiply the domain of pedagogic practice. Such conversations <clears throat> are in effect a constant constructing of practice as they discuss concerns, visions and questions that may open up new possibilities for practice. They constitute a becoming making of practice within a pedagogy of taking care that can change the cartographies of practice and modes of subjectivation. Scenario four, art practice, in storing cosmicities, <clears throat> the problematic gift of otherness. This is Isabel Stengers, a long quote. When a teacher feels that what she is doing is important, that it is not only a transmission of useful knowledge, she indeed participates to what may be called a cosmic adventure because the manner the children will experience new possibilities, feelings and ideas, or stubbornly keep to their abstractions, to their judgment about what matters and what does not, is indeed a cosmic stake." End of quote. If we accept that difference is what we have in common, then the pedagogical task of working with and responding to difference can be viewed as a cosmic adventure, paralleled with the adventure of belonging. In his book, The Different Modes of Existence, Etienne Suryo was concerned with a plurimodality of manners of being or a plurimodality of arts of existing. He was particularly concerned with those more precarious, less confident or marginalized existences and their unrealized possibilities or potentials. He argues that we can only reach being through the manners in which it is given or through its particular art of being. This deep concern for the plurimodality of manners or arts of being, I find useful for reflecting upon pedagogical practice and the different modes of existence involved. Suryo's different modes of existence posits a pluriverse, a plurality of arts of existing, but this does not imply a world of individual discrete or independent beings, but rather a world of modes of existence in relation which has implications for practices of convivial belonging, whose components are constantly interacting and evolving in parallel with their environments. A chief concern of Syrio is the process of the work to be made, which he chooses to exemplify in what some might think a rather outdated practice, a lump of clay being worked on by a sculptor. By illustrating the dynamic of the work to be made through the process of sculpting clay, Suryo is not describing a project, a process informed by a pre-constituted plan. He is proposing an unplanned journey. It's not a case of a work to be made according to a model. It's not a realization of potential through the creativity of an inspired artist. It is more of a correspondence, a corresponding of the to be made and the made. Nothing, artist or work, is given in advance everything emerges along the journey. Suryo is not describing a process initiated by an artist, therefore. This journey has no pilot or conductor. It's not a case of a project emerging through trial and error, but something much more vertiginous. At each moment, the process of the work to be made is precarious, and so is the being of the artist. The different facets of both the work to be made and the work, more or less complete, constitutes the problematic of what he calls instauration. It is as relevant to all practices, including pedagogic practice, as it, it, as it is to the art, practice of the artist. He writes, to instore is to follow a path. We determine the being to come in exploring its path. In blooming, the being demands its own existence. In all of this, the agent must yield before the work's own will, must work out what it is it wills, and must renounce himself or herself for the sake of this autonomous being, which he or she seeks to promote in accordance with its own right to existence. Nothing is more important in all forms of creation than this renunciation of the creative subject with respect to the work to be made. The work to be made installs a constant questioning. It does not provide the artist with directions, nor does the artist have a clear plan. 
again, Surios puts it this way, but let us not forget that the work's effect upon the artist never takes the appearance of a revelation. The work to be made never says to us, here is what I am, here is what I should be, a model you only have to copy. Rather, it is a mute dialogue in which the work seems enigmatically, almost ironically to say, and what are you going to do now? With what actions are you going, <clears throat> are you going to promote or deteriorate me? We might say that instaurative acts produce a new cosmos or cosmicity of practice. In philosophy, the conceptual frameworks developed by Plato, Descartes, Deleuze, Stengers, and other philosophers constitute or instaur different cosmicities. Similarly, we can say that artists instaur different cosmicities through their gradual unfolding of practice. The cosmicities of Pollock, Hepworth, Kusama, Bowling, or Murillo are not the same. This process of instauration can also be conceived in, ch <coughs> in children's drawing and other students' art practices in the gradual establishment of new organizations and relations of practice that open up new worlds of practice, new cosmicities. To repeat, there is no plan involved, no template to follow, but an ongoing journey that engages a corresponding of artist and work on different levels of existence, a correspondence in which the work and the artist each make the other exist. They institute or instaur each other. And with every new episode of practice, emerge new correspondences. This has important implications for pedagogic practice, both in relation to children's and students' processes of instauration of the becoming of practice and the becoming of self, which are indissoluble, but also to those of a teacher, as these processes lead to the instauration of new cosmicities of practice. To undermine, marginalize, or deprive a mode of existence is to deny its nature and act as though it has no reality, no legitimacy. This resonates with the scandalous lack of SEN provision in, uh, we're suffering from at the moment. Here, the notions of ontological pluralism and perspectivism discussed earlier become important. In this light, the anti-ableist program of NSAAD and the work of Claire Penketh and her team <coughs> and other people should also be mentioned here in relation to the struggle for the democratizing of neurodevised cosmicities as an insurrectional mode of pedagogic demands. That is to say, the right to have rights and the power this then bestows. Scenario five, instoring pedagogies of taking care. An important challenge of pedagogic work, therefore, is to support the evolving instauration of new arts of becoming and belonging to each student in the immediacy of their respective practices, whose potential may be waiting to be unfolded and legitimated, and which then opens new dimensions of practice for both student to teacher. A perpetual paradox of art education concerns the antinomy of its institutionalization, which is anathema to the radicality or the rupturing force or the otherness of art practice. The institutionalizing of practice tends to invoke forms of regulation and control, such as curriculum guidelines, assessment apparatuses, standards, competences, modes of audit that affect both teachers and students. The immediacy of art practice, on the other hand, concerns the unstoring of new worlds and their potentials with the journey of risking and advancing towards new ground, not with formulating according to established modes of practice and their objects. It is therefore important to view art in education, not only in terms of institutionalization and its mediations that may dispossess what, <coughs> that may dispossess what does not fit, but also in terms of instituting or in storing new cosmic cosmicities and their potentials. Art practice today is far more transversal in that it is composed of events and practices often not considered as art. New technologies and practices facilitate new transformations, hybridizations, a future pregnant with potential. When this reality and its ever-changing dynamic of new installations and their cosmological potential is considered, in relation to art in education, it begs the question of institutionalization mentioned above. It projects art in education itself into this dynamic in which institutionalization needs to be sensitive and flexible to new instituting forces. Such a move raises some sensitive issues relating to the notions of skill, technique, and practice itself, 
as well as the issues of assessment, competences and standards. This transversality of art practices <coughs> of art practice raises the issue of appropriate or commensurate pe pedagogies for art in education. Perhaps we may need to consider the notion of pagan pedagogies. Last paragraph. Pagan pedagogies emerge from the outside of established or controlled practices curriculums and may have the potential to transform institutionalized pedagogies and install or institute new modes, new modes of pedagogical work. I've already mentioned the importance of plural artist teacher narratives. Pagan pedagogies recognize the importance of instituting whilst acknowledging the, necess the necessity for social institutions, they infer their incompleteness. The ideas of a pluriverse, of multiple ontologies, imply the notion of more, of ongoing and evolving modes of practice and existence. In educational or art educational terms, we might argue that no amount of competencies, standards, guidelines, principles can exhaust the multifariousness of worlds as manifested in art practice and hopefully in art education. We therefore require pagan pedagogies or a pagan approach to pedagogy that acknowledges differences, divergence and multiplicity to respond effectively to the always more. But not, but not only by negating the negation of otherness and thereby confirming its existential legitimacy, pagan pedagogies do have to take care in responding to other practices, but also to take care of our frameworks of understanding which are also never complete or all embracing. Pagan pedagogies therefore reflect a speculative pragmatism, a pragmatism of the suddenly possible, experimenting with and supporting differences and their potentials in their, in their divers, divergent journeys of the work to be made, as well as opening themselves to the always incomplete pedagogic work to be made. <clears throat> 